All right, we're continuing on now with part two of the uh, Intro to Biology lecture. And we're going to be talking now about uh, the tree of life. And basically, this is an extension of my discussion in the last part where I said that all cells on planet Earth are derived from a single cell that arose about three and a half billion years ago. And all organisms since that time have that single cell as its common ancestor. And if we look at a representation of a tree of life, like the one you see in this picture, you can see that uh, we can divide out the different types of organisms based on some of their properties. And at each one of these nodes that I'm circling, that represents a common ancestor to two different branches. So if we look, for example, at bacteria, we can see that the common ancestor to bacteria and us over here, animals, um, was way, way back in time versus, um, you might be surprised to learn, fungus like mushrooms and animals like us diverged only relatively recently from one another if we look on a geologic time scale. All right, so let me talk for just a second about all the different types of organisms there are on the planet. Back in the um, 1700s, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Carl Linnaeus. And Carl Linnaeus was a taxonomist, which is a fancy way of saying that he was in, interested in trying to figure out the relationships among living organisms. He wanted to put some sort of order or classification system uh, upon all the animals on Earth and, and all the plants as well and the, cell, the little tiny cells like things like paramecia. And initially in the 1700s, about 1735 or so, he came up with a two-kingdom taxonomic scheme. Okay, taxonomy just means a, a process of naming and classifying. And his two-kingdom um, two, uh, system included an animal's okay, kingdom and a plant's kingdom. It was pretty basic, pretty straightforward. Now, as our understanding of organisms on the planet got better, and as our investigation tools, things like microscopes and other kinds of chemical analyses got better, over the centuries since that time, a number of other more complex classification schemes have been proposed. And one of the more uh, popular, I guess, or more commonly used classification schemes is one that was proposed in the 1960s by a gentleman by the name of Carl Woese. And Carl Woese said, based on his analysis, and, and he looked at some uh, chemical structure of a type of, of molecule inside cells that we're going to learn about later. He looked at the chemical structure of organisms, and based on that, came up with a classification scheme in which he said there were five different kingdoms out there. And those five kingdoms are, um, as listed here in this picture, you have the kingdom Animalia, okay, that's for all the animals, including us, kingdom Fungi, which includes all the mushrooms and yeast, kingdom Plantae, which is obviously all the different plants and trees on planet Earth, kingdom Protista, which is basically all of the single-celled uh, organisms uh, that do not make their own food. And then there was the kingdom Monera, which is basically the kingdom into which you put things such as bacteria. And now I want to point out that this isn't the only taxonomic scheme out there. There have been lots of others where they've proposed as many as eight different kingdoms based on relationships. So it really depends on whose classification scheme you refer to to determine just exactly how many kingdoms there are. Now today, um, the analyses that we use are primarily based on biochemical analyses to determine the relationships. And uh, we use something called uh, ribosomal RNA, which is a type of organic molecule found inside of living cells. And we're going to learn about what uh, RNA is in just a couple of weeks, in fact. And um, we use ribosomal RNA, and, the, and we compare the RNA that we find inside cells uh, between different groups of organisms to see who's most closely related to whom, presuming that if you have a, an RNA sequence more similar to another organism, you're probably more closely related to it. And if we look at the ribosomal RNA research out there right now, it's, it 
proposes that there are three domains. Now, a domain is a bigger group than a kingdom. So a domain may contain more than one kingdom of organisms. So we have three domains, domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. So what does that all mean? Well, let's start out with domain eukarya, or what we call the eukaryotes. Eu literally means true. EU means true. Karyo means kernel. So eukaryotes have a true kernel. Well, what does that mean? It really just means they have what we call a true nucleus. It means that the DNA that houses all the information for the cell is contained within a membrane-bound compartment of the cell that we call the nucleus. So uh, the domain eukarya are all organisms on planet Earth that have cells with a nucleus in them. So that includes things like us over here as animals, fungus, plants, algae, slime molds, all, um, all kinds of different single-celled organisms like euglena and paramecia, etc. We are all in the domain eukarya. Now, there are, there's another two domains out there. And both of these domains are characterized by being um, prokaryotes. What does that mean? Pro means before. And as you remember, karyo means kernel. So these are literally cells before a nucleus. In other words, they do not have a true nucleus. They still have DNA. It is just not compartmentalized and, or contained within a discrete location called a nucleus. It just freely floats within the cell. Okay, so prokaryote means before nucleus or before kernel. Eukaryote means true kernel, true nucleus. If we look at the prokaryotes, there are two domains of, of prokaryotes, the domain bacteria and the domain archaea. And we'll learn a little bit more about these different groups. If you're curious and want to read up ahead, and in fact, it's probably a good idea that you do, you can check in your first chapter of your book and read a little bit more uh, about the differences between these groups. But we'll, we'll come back to these again. For now, the main thing you need to get down is what is a eukaryote, what is a prokaryote, and how do they differ from one another. Okay. Now, once we have some sort of a, a, a scheme of understanding the relationships among different organisms, then we have to ask ourselves, well, maybe we need to have some sort of a classification system to make sense of these organisms and use a naming system that allows us to more clearly and quickly understand the relationships among the organisms. And Carl Linnaeus, that guy I talked about, from the 1700s, was the first to come up with a scientific naming system or the taxonomy that we use today. And he called it binomial, that means bi means two, nomial means name, nomenclature. Nomenclature means naming system. So this is a two name naming system, binomial nomenclature. So for example, if we think about the scientific name for us as humans, we are homo sapiens, two words. Okay, binomial nomenclature. The homo part refers to something called our genus. And I'll show you on the next slide a little bit better what that means. And the sapiens part is our species designation. I'll give you a couple other examples. Anthropleura xanthogramica, which is this in this picture right here, is a green sea anemone. Canis lupus, you might know, or maybe you don't, that's a wolf. Canis domesticus is the household dog we all have as pets. Now, a couple terms that are related to this idea of binomial nomenclature. One is taxa, T-A-X-A. -A. That's plural for taxis. And taxa are basically your uh, groups or families or um, collections of organisms that fit within a particular naming. Okay, that's kind of the easy way of saying it. Um, and the, the, the singular, I'm sorry, is that taxis is taxon. I'm getting ahead of myself in my uh, Latin here. So anyway, way, plural is taxa, singular is taxon, and this is basically just a naming. Okay, it's, it's just the group. Um, could be a group of primates, all the monkeys, for example. It could be a group of uh, dog-like creatures, all the Canis members, 
are a taxon. And species, again, is the individual designation for one collection of organisms that all mate with one another. Okay, they have the ability to interbreed. All right, this last slide here is going to show you the taxonomic hierarchy that you need to know for class. And this is a classification scheme that um, starts out with the largest group of organisms and then starts splitting out the organisms into smaller and smaller groups. And actually, this particular table or um, illustration I'm showing you here is missing domain up top. And remember, you can have one of three domains. It can be the, the day, domain eukarya, the domain pro. Um, Prokarya or the domain Archaea. So in this case, um, if we're going to talk about classifying us down here, Homo sapiens or human beings, here's how we would go about uh, naming us according to all these groupings. We start out with the largest group. We are in the domain Eukarya, meaning that we do have a true nucleus inside of all of our cells. And then if we look among all the eukarya, that includes things like fungus and plants and single-celled pond animals and algae and, and uh, insects and other kinds of animals, we only fit within one group of those. We fit into the kingdom animalia. Okay, so now we've weeded out things like plants and fungus uh, and single-celled protists. We're into the plant, uh, the kingdom animalia. And if we look among all the different kinds of animals that are on planet Earth, we fit into a subgroup of animals, a phylum, called chordata. And that just means we have a uh, backbone, we have a spinal cord uh, encased inside of a vertebral column. And then if we look at all of the different organisms in this picture that all have a backbone, we fit into a smaller class. Because if you think of animals with backbones, there are birds, there's lizards, there's frogs, there's um, humans. Um, and we fit into a smaller group or class of organisms called mammalia, which means we have the ability to produce breast milk, uh, we're warm-blooded, we um, carry our, our young within us until we give birth to them instead of doing things like laying an egg, which is what a frog, a bird, or a reptile would do. And then if we look within the class of mammalia, remember that's a pretty big group. That includes everything from cows and dogs and sheep and monkeys to us. Uh, we fit within a smaller group called an order, and the order we fit into the, is the order primates. And then if we divide down further, we fit into a family called the hominidae family. And within the family hominidae, we are in a special subgroup or genus called the homo genus. And we are in that genus the one species called sapiens. So our name is Homo sapiens. And by the way, whenever you see um, scientific nomenclature, the genus name, which is the first name of the two, is always capitalized. You can see here, HOMO is capitalized. And our species name is always in lowercase, sapiens. And it always follows second, OK? HOMO sapiens. So what you need to know on this is what is a taxonomic hierarchy. So the key words you need to focus in are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And know that as you go down that list, you get to a smaller and smaller and smaller group until you get to a single organism. That's the species down here. OK, part three, we're going to go on and talk about how scientists do what they do when they do research.